Okay, it looks like it's time to get started. I see there are still a few people um, joining us, but uh, um, we should start pretty much on time. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of CNI, and um, I'm delighted you can join us with this closing plenary talk for our virtual um, spring meeting. Um, I'm sorry that you couldn't join all of us last night for our intended reception in San Diego. It would have been a pleasure to see you all in person, but um, we still have some uh, wonderful, wonderful things for you. Um, many of you saw, um, I believe, Rob Sanderson's opening plenary yesterday, uh, which was, I thought, um, tremendous and really thought-provoking. And uh, for those of you who couldn't join us for that, we hope to have the video available pretty soon. Um, I do want to note that um, while this is the closing plenary of our virtual meeting, our virtual meeting will continue on through the end of May. Um, and we have uh, many um, uh, breakout project briefings scheduled over that period. You should have received information about them and how to sign up for them. Um, uh, the fact that you're here is a very good sign that you've got that information because you managed to get here. Um, and we will be adding some other events over that period. And you'll get announcements on those as well. Um, today, though, uh, we're here to um, hear from uh, Tara McPherson um, and just a couple of very brief mechanical things before um, uh, I introduce uh, Tara. Um, for uh, many of us have become much more expert with Zoom over the past uh, week or two than we plan to be necessarily, so I'll just touch on this slightly. Uh, we are in what is technically called webinar mode as opposed to um, uh, um, meeting mode, which means that um, video and audio from the participants is uh, turned off um, by default when you join. Um, we will be, Tara has agreed to take some questions at the end, um, and we'll be doing that through the Q&A um, uh, um, button down at the um, bottom of uh, the screen. Um, it basically, uh, when we call for questions, you can just um, uh, click on that and it'll give you a box and you can put your question in. And um, I will sort of sort those and relay them to Tara. Um, and uh, she's agreed to uh, field some. Um, so that's about all I think I need to say about that. Um, so let me uh, turn and introduce Tara. And um, I am delighted to welcome Tara back to CNI. Um, she has um, been part of the CNI community for literally um, decades now. Um, she is the, um, she's a professor and department chair at the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts and um, has been a genuine pioneer in um, a number of scholarly communications platforms that were targeted for um, uh, primarily humanistic scholarly communication. Um, first a system called Vectors, and then more recently a system called Scalar. Um, these are these were both important systems, both significantly and by design very different from each other and attempting to address different um, parts of the spectrum of scholarly communication. Um, and both not only significant in their adoption and what they contributed to um, the communication of the digital humanities and the advance of the field, but also because now they've had enough adoption and enough time that Tara can really reflect on 
what's been learned from them and what's been learned through the course of their, um, you know, maturing and adoption and um, uh, ongoing lives. Um, I want to note that Kara is doing, this is, this is one small piece of Tara's scholarly scope, which just continues to blow me away. Um, uh, she's had two recent books out, um, one titled Feminist in a Software Lab, and the other an edited volume on digital youth innovation and the unexpected. Um, both of those uh, came out in uh, 2018. And um, she's currently um, working on a really fascinating um, study about the use of online platforms to uh, transmit hate speech um, uh, and, and how that ecosystem um, operates. Uh, she, you can find a much more elaborated biography on the, um, on the website, but um, I'm just looking forward to Tara's um, both enthusiasm and insight. Um, those, those are two traits I associate very strongly with her work and her presentations. And with that, uh, I'm going to go away and turn it over to Tara. I'll be back at the end to moderate questions. Over to you, Tara. Thanks a lot, Cliff. And um, thanks to Diane and Beth and everyone at CNI for putting this together. And um, thanks to those of you in the audience. As I um, was getting things together this morning, I thought that you know it's a very odd thing to be talking about these projects in the moment of crisis that we're in. And um, I hope that at the very least, you know, um, having something to focus on for a bit um, rather than your social media feeds will will give you a bit of break from um, the kind of relentless stream of information. I think a lot of us are navigating right now. I hope that um, you and your loved ones are safe. Um, I can also say this is the first time that I've ever done a keynote in yoga pants, but since I'm seated, you won't know that. Um, you probably know that that's one of the real benefits of Zoom, right, is only um, um, dressing from the waist up. But I'm going to take a slightly roundabout path today to reflect on about um, 20 years of working in the design of digital media and digital platforms. And um, I'm going to kind of indulge myself just a little bit to tell you some about how I came to do this work, because I think it's important for understanding the projects I've worked on. Then I'll briefly tell you a bit about Vectors and Scalar, the projects that Cliff mentioned, in case you're not familiar with them. And then, um, you know, midway through and at the end, reflect some on the lessons that I think I've learned as we moved through the process of, of building both of these experiments. But um, now I want to go way back to um, sometime in the 1990s. And um, I'm awake from a dream and realize that I've been dreaming in the most vivid color of my life, inhabiting deeply cinematic sequences full of interesting camera angles that shimmer and um, with light and shadow. I've noticed that my dreams have become highly edited, really intricate um, shifting sequences of narrative of point and view. And I realized that my brain has begun to process at a very visceral level the lessons of film production that I'm learning in a graduate seminar on feminist film. And you know, deep in my unconscious at night, exploring that visual language of film, even as I sleep. At that moment in the 90s, I was enrolled in an intense doctoral program in an English department that was focused heavily on what we then called high theory and also on feminist film. And you know, in those years as a graduate student, I definitely dreamed about theory, but these dreams are different. They're cinematic and they're activating other senses and they're moving me around and through the theory that I'm also studying, but in different and related ways. 
And that, that moment in which I realized that making, that my physical interaction with video and with film were really shaping my capacity to know, began to inaugurate what would be a decades long commitment to practice, to forms of physical making in the world. Um, and also a grounding across my career in an allegiance to feminist practice and to feminist activism. So, you know, I could, as an origin story, apocryphal or not, you know, really kind of locate much of what I've come to do since that time um, through an experience that allowed me to make, in this case, film, in a way that encouraged me to think across a theory practice divide. And that experience really came to guide how I navigate my career now in media studies and in the digital humanities really kind of helping to explain how um, against like any kind of predictable um, logic, I became a feminist um, in a software lab. Across the arts and humanities, I think theory and practice these days are often poorly integrated in our universities. Arts practice is almost always cleaved away from art history. At my university, those disciplines are in different schools. Few film and media scholars are also media makers. Digital design and programming get taught in different buildings, you know, strewn across campus in very different places. And these divisions are really reinforced by structures that make it hard to combine theory and practice or the sciences with the humanities in our curricula, evaluation and promotion structures, in different disciplinary methodologies, and in the forms of scholarly output that we privilege in the academy in a variety of ways. Makers, folks called media specialists, lab technologists, least, um, less often hold tenured positions um, or professorships. And labs often serve to rigidly reinforce hierarchical distinctions across the university. My employer, the School of Cinematic Arts at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, has long claimed to integrate theory and practice. So students in all of our disciplines um, take courses in both making and kind of hands-on production, whether um, digitally or not, and in theory and history. And we are um, committed to that crossover but honestly, the programs are poorly integrated in um, much of their design. In an attempt more recently to figure out how to heal this divide between making and critical theory, um, the school had launched the Institute for Multimedia Literacy in 1998, at about the time I arrived on campus. And that was a research institute that was really committed to thinking about um, building a space where students and faculty could move across the theory practice divide in digital media. That institute has since grown into a new division in the school called Media Arts and Practice, which includes one of the few practice-based PhD programs in the United States, where students produce um, digital dissertations that are hybrid in a variety of forms. And we also now have an undergraduate major and minor in that division. In its original form, um, the IML was a lab of sorts, rather like a studio. It was housed off campus or on the edge of campus in a lovely modernist building with lab-like classrooms and a kind of space for experimentation and freedom outside of curricular structures. In its current form, it's more institutionalized. Uh, reality I want to talk a little bit more about later, about what happens as we standardize forms and institutionalize them. And um, now MAP includes a series of research labs with particular structures as well. So as a program, as a physical space, as a community, um, MAP fosters aesthetic experimentation, but it's deeply tied to critical theory, to notions of social justice and activism, um, and to questions of representation. So I'll tell you just really quickly about a few grad student projects that come out of the space to give you a sense of its scope 
and how it relates to kind of other work that um, I undertake in um, the collectives I work in. So um, first is a project called Lady Mouth um, by Sarah Siston. It's a chat bot that Sarah built that um, is meant to engage with um, trolls on the internet. And it goes um, into Reddit and um, replies to um, misogynist language with quotes from feminist, a variety of feminists. Right? And Sarah has been tracking um, the replies to the chat bot's interactions and um, looking in particular at how long it takes folks to realize they're interacting with a bot and um, not with a feminist. I mean, there are obvious reasons to have a bot do this work for you, given the kind of violent interaction women often experience online when they try to intervene in spaces. So this is a project that's both performative in the kind of tradition of um, feminist performance art and technological in its engagement in a particular space. Catherine Griffiths, who's just finishing her dissertation, um, is working um, to really kind of think about understanding algorithmic procedure and has worked with scientists to build a series of tools that visualize decision trees for um, AI and algorithmic processes, often to kind of foreground um, junctures where decisions are being made that are not completely thought through um, as the program kind of grows in its own accord. Triton Mobley is working on um, visualization and race and new media and has designed a series of projects which help us think through how color matters and comes to be in digital spaces. And finally, Samantha Gorman runs a, a fairly successful um, interactive studio called Tinder Claws that does a variety of publication and game design. Um, Tindar is an AR game that's um, very satirical, it's very successful. It um, trains you to feed your emotions to the AI through an AR interface. Um, they've just released a new project um, for the Oculus called The Under Presents. Um, so it's, you know, she's simultaneously recently finished a dissertation and has also um, released several um, commercial games at the same time. So across the division, there's a real commitment to hands-on production. Um, there's also an explicit commitment to theoretical inquiry, to activism, to social justice practice, and to really producing multimodal outcomes that extend beyond uh, written dissertation explaining um, practice-based work, but to actually have components of the dissertation be practice-based themselves. My own lab work began at the old IML, and I work closely with students in the media arts and practice program. Um, IML supported um, vectors in the early days, which I'll talk about briefly, and later the authoring platform Scalar. But such hybrid programs, I think, are still pretty rare in the US, particularly at a department level that allows students to move fluidly across theory and practice um, alongside political commitments. But their numbers are growing. And we also see, as I think many of you probably participate in, various types of maker spaces, labs, and collaboratories um, dotted across our university landscapes, often housed in libraries, although sometimes in departments. Still, I think these programs often meet familiar forms of resistance. Some such reactions might just be categorized as academic resistance to change, a kind of traditionalism within the academy that tends to favor structures and approaches that we already know and to treat emerging paradigms with a degree of suspicion. But another vector of opposition to these changes comes from those whose worries I think are a bit different. These critics worry that innovation labs and maker spaces hew too closely to the kind of techno-utopian logics that we see coming out of Silicon Valley. And I'm actually pretty sympathetic to these arguments. 
in the US, it's not hard to see that there are lines of convergence between um, curricular programs and digital technologies and the needs of corporate technology firms. Some of these firms actually fund labs at my university and probably at some of yours. And others are, firm, are funded by um, different corporate benefactors focused on entrepreneurship or innovation. And I believe there's really no doubt that such sponsorship torques scholarship in very particular ways, ways we might be wary of. And yet these very pressures, I think, necessitate not a repudiation by the humanities of the digital, but rather a demand that humanity scholars increasingly operate within that very space. I think there are unique skill sets humanity scholars and artists bring to the table that allow us to imagine technology differently and to raise important questions about the ethics of technological design. If we're really concerned about the escalating corporatization of our campuses from online learning platforms to new regimes of management to casualized labor to the inroads that Zoom is making in this crisis that we're now inhabiting, then an engagement with technology and the digital seems a crucial, if not only way, to, in, to really mitigate and investigate some of these concerns. And I would argue there are recent precedents in the history of a university that suggest to us how such work might take shape. My, early, my graduate education and early scholarly career centered on film and media studies, the feminist film work that I began with. While my PhD program was in an English department, the opportunity to engage in media practice existed along the margins of the curriculum. One class in particular profoundly rejiggered how I would come to understand the relationship of making to theory, leading to the vivid dreams I started this talk with. It was a team talk course by the film theorist Patricia Mellicamp and the feminist video artist Cecilia Condit. And an interesting side note is Cecilia is now in her 70s and has recently become a TikTok star. She was featured recently in the New York Times. Um, students in our seminar were encouraged to reach outside of their comfort zones and to work in a medium that was less familiar to them. So in my case, as someone who primarily was a writer in the class, I was expected to make films. That experience deeply reconfigured how I understood feminism and collaboration. And it gave me a hands-on engagement with making that still really shapes my research. In the class, we were investigating how one might make media in dialogue with ideological feminist critique. And the course structure made it clear that the two were intricately interwoven, that you needed to have both in order to achieve a fuller picture. These types of interactions are incredibly important lessons for how we might conceive of the rich possibilities for a politically engaged, humanities-based engagement with digital technologies. Feminist film studies emerged from an entanglement with what we now call critical making, even if the terminology at the time was different. We could trace decades of feminist media makers blurring the line between theory and practice. Their work powerfully illustrates how theory and making exist in rich political feedback loops. They understood that technology mattered and that we needed to study technologies, but also to use them in new ways. Still, feminist film and media studies today does not always exhibit such strong ties to practice it was, as was evident in the 70s and 80s when feminists were working both in and outside of the academy in very um, deliberate ways. The conjuncture of theory and practice that was so crucial to the field has been hard to maintain as feminism has been institutionalized within the academy. I see this split as a loss to the field. I think that now many feminist film scholars are not in direct um, contact with practices of making 
and I think that impoverishes the work that we might do. Digital media studies and digital humanities now offer the possibility for renewing the forms of dialectic and interdisciplinary inquiry that was so valued by feminist film scholars in the 70s and 80s. While there's no guarantee that emerging makers labs and digital design programs will hold theory and practice or ethics and making in productive tension um, toward progressive ends, they can offer a place for such work to unfold if we design our programs carefully. I have spent much of the past two decades working through and experimenting with feminism and with intersectional and deeply collaborative technological design, first with the journal Vectors and now with the software platform Scalar, um, which these days is housed at the Amundsen Lab in the USC libraries. Vectors began over 15 years ago as a space for experimentation in the beginning in screen languages, in open access publishing, and in collaborative design and authorship. The core production team was very small. Our teams remain quite small. And at the time, Steve Anderson and I were editors. Eric Lawyer and Reagan Kelly were creative directors. And Craig Dietrich served as technical lead. Based in the film school, we focused more on questions of the expressive capacities for media and on interface than a large scale digitization or text analysis. So we were outliers in many ways in what would become the digital humanities, um, focused on different sets of questions. We aimed to publish work that couldn't exist in print while also exploring new infrastructures for distribution and free access. Our initial process of production um, wasn't really like a journal, but instead featured a fellowship model that brought scholars in for a kind of summer camp to work with our team and to begin um, the act of collaborative, collaboratively building projects that allowed a scholar to express an argument in multimedia. And the first journal issue went live in 2005. Um, this image is a screen grab from um, those, um, that first issue in the winter of 2005. And you could see already that, you know, it's a, a, bit, a bit wacky for a journal. The um, stack of images to the far right, the text in red, are the table of contents, which you could shuffle and realign in different ways. So there was always a kind of, of playfulness in the journal, in its, in its interface tried to communicate that act of play. We were interested in how multimodal expression might allow for different relationships to form, of form to content, and wanted to explore the specificities of digital media for politically engaged scholarship. We asked how scholarship might more directly engage the emotions and multiple senses. We wondered how new media might come together with the concerns of feminism, of critical race studies, of activism, of environmental critique and of queer theory. We worked at the nexus of the arts and humanities rather than the humanities and the sciences. A piece like Public Secrets by Sharon Daniel with Eric Lawyer brought together um, many hours of audio footage, testimony of imprisoned women at Chowchilla, the largest women's prison in the country. Um, Daniels had collected this oral testimony in her work with the organization Justice Now. The user can navigate the piece by a series of themes like inside, outside, public secret, utopia, um, through individual women's stories or in a more random fashion. The aesthetic design and structure of the project reinforce its goals calling our attention to the shifting borders between inside and outside, incarceration and freedom, oppression and resistance. By navigating the piece, the fine lines demarcating the, binder, the binaries shift and morph, reconfigure and grow fuzzy, unsettling easy assumptions about us and them in a carceral state. 
It's intersectional in both its design and concept. The project also moved beyond the borders of the university, being used both by activist organizations in challenging the prison complex, but also being exhibited in museums and galleries worldwide. A project like Public Secrets begins to imagine new possibilities for the archive as it mutates into the database. I like to think of it and many of the Vectors projects as databases with points of view that are really meant to contextualize the database, guiding the viewer's emergence in the piece with the logic of a video game. So every time you interact with the piece, it will be different based on choices you make and what is opened up to you as you choose particular choices. I would say it encourages exploration more than mastery or completion. And a variety of other Vectors projects attempted similar things. Um, this is a project called Dead Reckoning. It explores military vision and perspective and was really a kind of prequel to a book um, on the same topic that the scholar Karen Kaplan has recently published. Jennifer Terry created Killer Entertainments, um, launched you know, before we had YouTube, um, as a project that collected hundreds of um, online videos produced by sh soldiers during the Afghanistan conflict, and then really deterred those videos to help us understand the visual logics of masculinity in wartime. Emily Thompson built a project which located historic archive of sound complaints in New York um, over a historic map that allows the viewer and the user to kind of hear historic sounds of New York and interact with the project in a variety of ways. Many of these projects were nominated for Webbies, were featured on you know, um, public radio, received a fair amount of press. Um, but, you know, Vector's projects were weird and unique. They rewarded slow reading. They really required attention and care from the user, asking the user to stop and think and also to linger and feel. They weren't really interested in data mining a million photographs or producing a quantitative analysis as they were invested in layering the interpretive humanities techniques, which many of us still cherish, within a digital environment, allowing for close reading and textual annotation. But as much as I love the work that we did with Vectors, I think of many of the projects I've participated in over a career, um, it's still my favorite. Um, there were many problems with it as well. Um, it, we stopped publishing in 2013. Um, as you could see from this slide. Um, the projects were mostly one-offs. They were labor intensive and demanding to create. When you carefully integrate form and content for every project, you're faced with hundreds of hours of design and programming time. Even after we developed special middleware tools with Craig Dietrich, which streamlined the production process. So obviously such a production can't, such a process can't really scale. It's not something that you could reduce to a template and roll out to many, many users. The projects also demanded a great deal from every reader for each piece had its own unique design logic um, that could be confusing or hard to navigate. Learning to interact with one piece didn't guarantee you could easily decipher the next because each used its own aesthetic format. Th these elements, I think, combined to make the projects challenging for long-term preservation and sustainability. Many of the projects were built in flash and you know, will become increasingly inaccessible as new browsers um, stop supporting that platform. I love the capacities embedded in Flash, but I think we are still not well suited to save projects built in Flash, and many of those are now obsolescing. Of course, the projects never worked on iPads. Um, is still illustrating, because um, we predated the iPad, right? Illustrating the ways that corporate turf wars can really come to destabilize scholarly projects. Importantly, the pieces poorly address the needs of disabled users 
an ongoing issue with many digital projects, which I think the scholarly community grapples with, but probably doesn't have the resources it needs to adequately address. In an ideal world, I believe that each scholarly project would find the design and structure best suited to its individual evidence, argument, and purpose. And many times that format will be a print book. But that world is hard to fund and perhaps even harder to sustain and preserve. In many ways, these vectors projects were anticipating apps for they incorporated multiple senses, even touch, into beautifully designed packages that served ear, eye, and hand. Um, when we first launched, viewers were sometimes perplexed by the interfaces. But after several years of sweeping across iPads, the interfaces, I think, seem a little less experimental today. Moving from vectors and those kinds of constraints we, we discovered as we built the projects, um, we developed Scalar, a robust multimedia authoring platform that addresses a lot of the shortcomings of earlier work. It's pretty scalable. Um, the name is a pun, as a scalar, as a force that multiplies vectors. It's built with web standards and sustainability in mind. It interfaces with archives in interesting ways. It features a customizable API for more adventurous users, which allow projects to have a vectors-like feel. Over time, it's seen um, really good uptake in university classrooms, in libraries, in museums, in some university presses. We now have tens of thousands of users. Um, many different installs of Scalar exist in other locations, including Harvard, the Newberry Library, different presses. Um, we um, are available on GitHub and through other spaces for a community of users to help us build out the software. Thousands of projects have been built in Scalar of a number of kinds, and the platform and its uses continue to evolve. What it loses in the quirky aesthetics of vectors, and I do find those things to be losses, it makes up for in a certain robustness. As with vectors, we offer, we internally try to support projects that engage issues of race, of gender, of social justice, but the platform can be used for myriad purposes across and beyond the humanities. The group brings together a large group of um, participants from our core development team that grew out of Scalar to a number of institutions, archives, and presses that have worked with us at different points in time. We've been lucky to um, have funding from Mellon and from NEH that helped to sustain the projects. And the kinds of projects that happened are, are multiple. They don't, they don't find um, a single form. This piece um, is a, a anthology in digital form. It's open access. It includes both an archive of an activist organization called Third World Majority of its early work with youth in digital media, as well as a series of essays and interviews um, undertaken by scholars that um, help frame that archive in particular ways. So it's a kind of hybrid project spanning archive and edited volume. The classroom use of Scalar has probably been one of its most substantial use cases. This is a project from Penn um, that brought together archival materials from the library with a small freshman seminar and the students collectively produced um, this project, The Voyages of the Clarence, over the course of a semester. The Newberry Library has been a very exciting and robust partner for Scalar and they've adopted some widgets which allow open transcription of materials they hold in the library for their community of users and have begun to train interns to work with them on the projects as well. They maintain their own um, install of Scalar. Digital Paxton is a critical edition and teaching platform that bring together a vast array of resources 
collecting material um, from several different collections and archives into one digital interface, allowing a greater um, spread of information about a particular historical incident than exists in any given um, library or institution on its own. Presses are using Scalar in a variety of ways. This project launched this month and illustrates new capacity we've built into Scalar to support 3D models. And um, it's published by Stanford Press and was undertaken by Elaine Sullivan. The University of Illinois Library is also using Scalar to support a number of digital projects. Scalar has been used for digital dissertations. This project, Redshift and Portal Metal by Misha Cardenas. Um, and using the API, um, our creative director, Eric Lawyer, and his collaborator, Evan Bissell, have done a number of projects which have a more experimental interface and take us back to the kind of shape of older vectors projects. The software that underpins Scalar was born of frustrations we saw scholars having working with traditional database tools. So if vectors engaged um, political and feminist work at the level of content and through integrating form and content. Scalar actually tries to learn these lessons at the um, level of technological design. So we tried to integrate things we had learned from um, 15 years of working with progressive feminist scholars into the actual design of Scalar software. And in the book that, I, that Cliff mentioned, Feminist in a Software Lab, I make an argument that the software itself is feminist, not its uses, but its actual design. And I'm not gonna go into that here, but I'd be happy to talk about that some in Q&A. Um, we are now experimenting um, with how we might build new spaces, spaces that encourage um, making iteration and remaking, learning those lessons from feminist film theory, and have located Scalar within the new Amundsen Lab at the USC libraries. It's a project of the Sydney Harmon Academy of Polymathic Study, a space I direct, and it has a strong focus on hybrid undergrad education. Um, with the ground um, on the ground leadership from director Curtis Fletcher, we host a series of events that teach the use of digital tools within the context of social and cultural issues and fund vectors like research projects for faculty and student research teams. We also um, host, hopefully this summer, we're not quite sure now with the crisis, um, summer um, institutes for librarians and universities to send folks to campus in teams to learn to use the platform. Looking at the lab's website, it seems less overtly feminist than our vectors projects did. Even as I um, know that as with Scalar, feminism is in there. Nonetheless, I think it's worth noting that along the path from vectors to scalar to the lab, the mark of feminism becomes less overtly visible in many of our efforts. Our greater stability and in institutionalization runs the risk of blunting our feminist and progressive force. In building funded spaces and in institutional support, I think this is a risk we have to be aware of and to grapple with. We try to do so honestly and often in the lab, and we've learned other lessons as well. First, undertakings like vectors or scalars surface real tensions between two conflicting scholarly impulses, a desire for experimentation and a need for continuity. This friction is surfaced frequently for our team over the years with extensive discussions centering on how to balance innovation with stability. We frequently hear from scholars who were keen to develop unique multimedia formats for their scholarship, and I'm sure many of you do as well, hoping to merge an argument's content and its expression in original ways. They are often seeking vectors-like interfaces that uniquely suit their own materials. Yet traditional mechanisms of peer review, established publication formats, 
and existing library infrastructure are still not well structured to support these one-off efforts. The Academy's role as a site for continuity and stability, and as a trusted agent for preservation, mitigates against the impulse to experiment with new technologies within scholarly communication and research in the humanities. How might new forms of scholarship be vetted, distributed, and preserved? How would they be understood? We're still struggling with answers to these questions 20 years later. Even as we have seen emerging forms take root, like the video essay or podcast or robust 3D models, questions about scalability, sustainability, and preservation still remain. A second theme that emerged across many years of production concerned the value of failure. While it has become commonplace to extol the virtues of failure, few within the academy actually lead with discussions of when things break and what went wrong. As I promoted vectors and then scalar at venues like CNI or ARL or the MLA, it behooved me to highlight our successes and the uptick of the platform. It's still quite hard to have an honest conversation about what has not worked and the many challenges we faced. Scalar received funding as part of its ongoing, as the Mellon Foundation's ongoing effort to transform university presses and the scholarly monograph. And I would say we mostly failed here. Progress has been very uneven. Some press, presses have embraced change more openly, but others have not. Collaboration between presses has been very hard to engineer as presses actually work well in a model when they compete with each other for projects and distinguish themselves from one another. We've instead seen presses more interested in developing their own in-house platforms than in a shared ecosystem. Meanwhile, a publishing tool like Scalar has seen greater uptake in, the cl in classrooms, libraries, and museums than within university presses, even if that was the original audience for the platform when we first began to build it. Mellon has funded a number of related platforms, some developed by presses and libraries, but it's very unlikely that these platforms will all be in sustained use in another 10 or 20 years. We've seen how hard it is to sustain platforms as we've continued to support and extend Scalar over the years. Our funding comes from a complex and ever-shifting patchwork of grants, USC resources, and partnerships. Because Scalar is a platform largely used by those outside of USC, it's sometimes hard for the university to see it as a USC project. Um, my development team is very small. We began Vectors and Scalar as research experiments to see what we could learn about screen aesthetics and digital networks. Now that Scalar has grown from experiment to relatively stable platform, um, its needs really outstrip the DIY spirit that we began with and that many of my team most love. The three S's, security, support, and sustainability are constant and ongoing issues that we navigate as best we can, but are always navigating with some degree of precarity. In attempting to address them, it sometimes feels like we lose sight of the creative elements that drew us to these projects in the first place. These transition points are hard and real. They require new forms of university support and cross-institutional collaborations. Yet despite these tensions, strains, and failures, we also know that projects like Scalar and Vectors offer rich objects to think with and through, bringing together scholars, publishers, librarians, technologists, administrators, and others in collaboration and dialogue. These conversations shift the imagination of those involved, producing new insights and new possibilities, fomenting change, I hope, long after the conversations have moved on and the platforms have ended. 
Such projects also put a spotlight on the importance of cultivating leadership as the humanities address the challenges and opportunities in this shifting technological landscape. I have long valued CNI in this regard. Librarians and others at my first CNI meeting, shortly after Vectors launched, helped me understand the many things we were doing wrong and how we might address them. In creating a model that regularly brings diverse communities together, CNI highlights rich dialogue and crucial forms of collaboration. Scholars pursuing wacky edge projects gain wise counsel from librarians, IT specialists, policymakers, and funders. Conversations across different fields and institutions help surface shared problems and help us see the terrain for intervention. It's probably not an accident that the dual embrace of theory and practice in feminist film communities in the 1970s came at a time of widespread changes in communication technologies, from the advent of cheaper, more portable cameras to the broad diffusion of television. The feminists that gathered to discuss feminist film in places like Edinburgh in the late 1970s understood their moment as a time to intervene in systems of production, representation, distribution, and exhibition, working on many fronts and through many modalities. They valued theory and practice, but they held the two in lively tension. The digital technologies of our own era call us to embrace similar strategies as we confront the diffusion of the digital through our dreams, our lives, and our platforms. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Tara. That was amazing. Um, uh, just, just an astounding reflection on, um, you know, uh, an, an arc of 40 years or more um, and the interplay of technology uh, communications, social uh, movements, um, really so much there. Um, I'd like to, well, first I'd like to just say thanks again, and uh, there's big applause showing up in the uh, chat. Um, uh, one of the really frustrating things about, um, about doing these by video is that there's no good way to generate uh, huge round of applause, um, but know that it's happening. Um, let's throw it open for questions, and I see we've got one already. Um, the, question, the question speaks to um, what constitutes feminist software design? I, I kind of left myself open for that one, didn't I? Yeah, it's, um, I, I, I mean that both as a metaphor and as a technological structure. So on the one hand, um, the process of designing the software came from um, a decade of very deep um, enmeshing with scholars who wanted to achieve particular kinds of goals. So um, the prototype for Scalar was a middleware platform Craig Dietrich built for building vectors projects. And those projects were very committed to um, a kind of horizontal um, alignment of certain ideas to allow less hierarchical structures that derived both from ideas in feminist theory and intersectional work and from our own um, model of collaborative practice. So in building Scalar, um, Craig Dietrich and Eric Lawyer wrapped a very weird implementation of a semantic layer around a database structure, which allows Scalar to perform in odd ways that make it very different than WordPress. So well, if you're reading a Scalar project, it doesn't feel that different than an online project like WordPress. The technological underpinnings of Scalar allow a kind of radical flattening where the platform itself understands an equivalency between the different parts. So a media file, a tag, a page, a block of text, um, a path, 
you could build pad as an in scalar are all um, functionally equivalent in the structure of the platform's technology. So that um, attempt to build and model a technological platform that understood hierarchy differently is one of the ways I see the platform functioning technologically as um, a, a piece of technology that has learned lessons from feminist theory. But I never put that in a grant application. Um, we have time for a few more questions. Um, <clears throat> I, I just want to share this one because um, of where it's from. And that this is uh, Don Waters, who um, <laughs> Hi, Don. was instrumental in, um, in uh, the Mellon Foundation's um, uh, participation in so much of the um, the arc of work you've described and he just absolutely he just says thank you so much for taking time for these reflections um, and that one I just thought you'd really appreciate we have a question <clears throat> here um, that's kind of a little bit related to one that I was also going to ask the question that's come in is would you say a little more about how you envision building a shared ecology for scholarly communication? There's a lot of people who are making an argument to do this, but often it seems that what that means is that they should abandon their projects and adopt mine. Yes. I mean, it's, I, I actually think it's a very hard thing to do. I mean, the um, larger kind of framework for Scalar was the Alliance for Networking Visual Culture, which was meant to be that ecology of um, scholarly sites like humanity centers, archives and libraries, and presses working together. And that human infrastructure was very hard for us to build and sustain. I think that Scalar has managed to um, build a relationship to fellow travelers that has benefited us and the fellow travelers, right? So um, one of our models right now for funding is to be written into grants with partners where we'll extend a portion of Scalar's um, functionality or add new features in partnership with institutions who need that feature in a particular way. So, um, about a year ago, we released a whole suite of um, editing functionality within, in, within Scalar that we developed with the University of California and Stanford presses to allow peer review to happen in Scalar. So you could, um, before a project went live, have editorial control over copy editing, but also forms of peer review. Um, the project that Stanford has just released that features 3D models is another of those partnerships where we worked with um, a community of scholars whose work use 3D heavily to figure out how Scalar could support those models when we hadn't been able to do that before. So, um, you know, we're also on GitHub and occasionally we receive kind of good kind of code back from folks. But, you know, that's not as robust as, you know, an original dream might have imagined it to be. So I think those, you know, scholarly ecosystems are um, hard to build in institutions that need to own their own creative, own and promote their own creativity, right? So I have continued conversations with um, both my dean and the senior leadership at my university about why they should fund Scalar at all if it's mostly used at other universities, right? There's a, a kind of um, territoriality that I think really works against kind of the shared ecosystems we would like to build. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, if I could maybe take our, the question we got in a little farther and speak to another aspect of shared ecologies. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I see with a lot of these platforms that are that have grown up, um, and this is not specific to um, Scalar, but to other platforms as well, is that um, we often don't focus much on 
the ability to move things from one platform to another, to import and export, to have um, some form of content interoperability or interchange. Um, could you maybe say a little about uh, the extent to which um, uh, Scalar um, thinks about that? And that was one of the real lessons we learned from the community at CNI, moving from vectors to Scalar so that you know, the Flash projects and vectors were sort of hermetically sealed within the world of Flash. And, you know, I, I still don't think anybody has a really good answer for what's going to happen to all those Flash projects, including ours, right? You know, I think, you know, some emulators are being built that might help. But um, Scalar was designed from the outset so that you could export the content in a variety of formats that might reasonably play forward, right? And you might lose certain aspects of the way the Scalar project was structured in exporting and moving forward the projects, but the ability to kind of retain a lot of what um, the structure and the um, material was, was still there. The one big absence there is that Scalar is not a media server, so all of the media files that are in Scalar, unless they're a very small size, are not contained in the Scalar project, they're linked to from outside. So um, we, um, Craig built a way to document the, the kind of provenance and data around those objects at the moment of importing something into Scalar so that um, wrapper that lets you know what the object was, where it came from, you know, ideally a thumbnail um, is still there, um, even if the object itself goes missing through link rot or, you know, other forms of kind of exporting the data. And um, that decision to not have the objects in the scalar projects was partially um, to not become a huge media server, but more um, importantly, to kind of adjudicate claims around copyright and um, right. what could go into a project and still publish it without rights or permissions, right? Because the projects are not, the pieces of media, the images are not actually in Scalar. So you could publish a Scalar project and not be publishing those more contested objects. Mm -hmm. so. That may ultimately help with the preservability of the objects too. Uh, I mean, I, I, I leave the, you know, many of these kinds of yeah. long-term questions about preservation and sustainability to kind of, you know, quicker minds than mine to help us figure out because it's not a strength of our team. And I think that's, you know, and questions like preservation and sustainability and um, um, ADA compliance, you know, these things are hard for small teams to grapple with at the, t at the moment they're also building, but really important to be thinking about as you're building so that you make the best choices you can and how you build. Yeah. We could take, I think, maybe one more question. Um, I think you may have just blown everybody away. Um, Tara, that was just wonderful. Thank you so very much.